So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's my great honor and pleasure to be here today. Uh, so first, I would like to thank the Exner Foundation uh, for this uh, wonderful honor and distinction. And I also would like to thank my uh, nominator, uh, Professor Wolfgang Knowles, and my dear, dear friends, and also for many years, uh, Luisa Tosi, for uh, taking the time to come and to join me here today and also for all the uh, support and friendship over the year. And she actually served as a role model for me when I was a young assistant professor. And so it really for me, from a village in Vietnam to stand in front of you here today, so it really, uh, 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 you know, touch and uh, emotionally for me. And so today I would like to share with you some of the, just highlight some of the research uh, in solar energy in, in my group. Um, and so the question here is why I am interested in solar energy. Uh, so I grew up during the final wars of, 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 of the Vietnam, Vietnam War, and I grew up in small villages in Vietnam and so basically this is how I live. For 16 years of my life, uh, I have no electricity. We use the oil lamp, as the, you, the one you see over there. And then, uh, you know, uh, we did not have access to uh, clean uh, drinking water. And so basically, I went to my neighbor house, put out the, the, the bucket into the water well. We got the water and it looked kind of brownish color and then we put in some powders and waited for it precipitated down and collect the clean water. And we did that the few times before we boiled the water and, and for drinking. And then uh, for cooking, I gather branches, I make fires and to cook and it take uh, quite some time. Um, and then, you know, for transportation, we walk around the village and, and uh, if you have a bicycle, you consider that you are quite wealthy back then. And so this is the photo of me in, in when I was uh, uh, 16 years old, and the scooter uh, wasn't mine, but you know it was nice to, to, to hop up and take the photo. And to my surprise, so the, the, the interest in solar energy have been with me for a long time since my village time. And back then, I remember because we always have to function with the sun. When the sun down, you went to sleep. And I always dream of, can I capture the light, uh, the sunlight, so that I could use at night to study. And so, you know, even though until this day, we get used to having electricity, everything that around us, globally, there's still about 700 million of people without access to electricity. And a large number of people in Africa and so, and, and also some in Vietnam. I was in Vietnam in, in the Highland area in December 2022. And I, I, my driver drove us around and we could see the people just sat in front of their house in the winter time, right? So I asked the driver, why don't they stay inside the house? And they said, because they have, don't have much electricity and very expensive. So sitting under the sun, they have the light to work, but also it warmed them up, right? And we're talking about this is 2022. And I was really sad because I left Vietnam for 32 years. And now there's certain area of Vietnam still the same like when I grew up. And so I immigrated to the US at the age of 21 years old with my family and uh, with a few words of English and no money. <laughs> Uh, so this is the photo of, of, of me uh, when I, I learned English at uh, Santa Monica College in 1992 with all the immigrants from uh, Mexico, from Poland. Um, and for, I started my research in, uh, at UCLA and uh, I've been doing my PhD. I study uh, photophysics of conducting polymer uh, with uh, using femtosecond laser spectroscopy. I also work a little bit on organic lye emitting dial, and, uh, and I spent 
three years as a postdoc at Columbia University, I decided to learn something new. I always interested in learning something new. So I switched field to work on molecular electronics and molecular cell assembly. And then I started my position at uh, University of uh, California, Santa Barbara uh, in 2004. And we work on variety, but mainly focus on carbon-based material and, uh, and we call organic semiconductor for emerging technology. I will show you today the organic photovoltaics, but we also work on other area. And, and so the question here, why should we care about the future energy, right? And why are we interested in uh, renewable energy? And so if you look at the chart here, it shows the world population over, over the years. And the world population, it took about 2 million years uh, for the world population to reach 1 billion and only 200 years more uh, to grow to 7 billion. And so prediction that by 2050, the world population expand to over 9 billion people and also the global economy is double. And that basically will lead to the future energy challenge. Uh, so the current global energy consumption is around 20,000 terawatt hours. And the projected assumption in, in uh, consumption in 2050 is double. And it due to the population growth, as I shown you on the previous slide, and also on the economic growth. And I got this uh, plot from, 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 from the Statista. And since we have a number of young people in the audience, and so to, to show you why energy will be a future challenge. So let's just go back to 100 years ago. So back then you see that um, for transportation, people went by horse, carriage, by bike, by foot, or by train, um, or by boat. And then for lighting, even though the electricity was discovered quite some time ago, but as I mentioned, not everybody could get access to electricity, even though back then, or even to today, um, and, and then for cooking, you know, people didn't have the fancy gas stove, electric stove, and you cook by, by coal. And let us step back to the present, and you can see why energy will be a big uh, challenge in the future. So nowadays, for transportation, people have car, high-speed train, airplane, and also, you know, a, a ship. And all of us, we actually we have different electronic devices, cell phone, computer, TV at home, refrigerator, and so on. So the bottom line here is that each of these appliances basically consume certain amount of uh, energy, and that will add up to the future energy challenge that we talk about. And also the big portion of energy going to lighting, as you can see from the map there. And so let's uh, take a little bit, about, uh, a look at a little bit about the energy generation. And you can see right now, and this is from different regions of the world, uh, and you have from North America to Asia, Pacific, Africa, and Middle East. Uh, so if you look here, uh, different part of the world, majority of this is still based on non-renewable energy, okay? And so basically, we're talking about gas, oil, and coal. So we see the big portion at the, to, that at this uh, sort of energy. And that will uh, already is cause the problem with the climate change. So in the plot I show you here, the uh, atmospheric carbon dioxide and you, at a function over time. And you can see it have increased quite a lot and continue to rise if we don't do anything about that. And then the question people ask, why should we care about the carbon dioxide? Because it, 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 the, the greenhouse gas that can absorb the heat from the earth, but it can also irradiate the heat back to the surface of the earth. And so the bottom graph, I show you, so the temperature uh, uh, and the baseline of the temperature over years. Uh, and then also you can see the situation of the temperature from this baseline, and the baseline is the average over a period of time, 30 years or more. And you can see here the red curve, it means the rise in the, 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 the surface of the Earth's temperature. And, and basically, uh, 2022 is one of the years that you can see a really hottest one. 
And so if we don't do something about that, and that will continue to lead to a lot of problem in the future. And so this one from the World Resource Institute, and they highlight key, key, uh, 10 key solutions needed to mitigate the climate change in the future. And basically, we need to retire the coal plant. We also need to invest in uh, clean energy, efficiency, and also uh, you know, many other, for example, shift the transportation to electric vehicle, and also increase in public transportation, biking, and so on. And so there are a, a, a number of things that we have to do uh, continuously. And so, so I get this uh, from the plot from BP Energy Outlook 2023, and so basically the current uh, energy uh, globally in terawatt hour from different sources, and then they also estimate different scenario for 2050. For example, if you have the accelerated scenario, so it means that you need to uh, reduce the carbon dioxide uh, by 75%. And the North scenario, which is the net zero, it means you have to reduce by 95%, and then uh, uh, and, and also order new momentum and so on. And so, but from this plot here, from the three scenario, you can see that the uh, uh, wind and solar, and they predict that that a big portion will be very continue to be important in the future at one of the main uh, uh, sort to generate renewable energy in addition to nuclear. Okay? And so the renewable energy like solar energy not only important in the future, but also change people's life, right? So how has solar energy changed our lives so far? So if you look here, so for us, it's not that important because we have access to the grid electricity. But in places like, for example, Mongolia, in Middle East, or in Africa, so having just a solar panel or module can change people's life, right? Because it allows you to function at night, allow you to live life. And I also really like the, 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 the photo uh, in the bottom there with the camel, have the solar module that to uh, uh, cool down the uh, refrigerator uh, for the to deliver vaccine to Africa. So that uh, photo come from the movie uh, uh, directed by also Alan Heger, that the power of the sun uh, a number of years ago. And then for the rest of the world, we continue to see solar farm and, and solar uh, everywhere, basically on the rooftop and uh, in the parking structure around the world. Okay? Uh, so let's take a look at the various solar cell technology. The one I show you uh, mainly from silicon semiconductor. And so, but silicon uh, uh, semiconductor and also solar made from silicon have been around or people started doing research in the early uh, uh, 50s, 1950s. And it took many years that until the day that we see it everywhere. And it also increased the efficiency over time. And beside the silicon solar cell, there are also other types of they call emerging uh, photovoltaic technology. For example, in this list here, you see perovskite, you see uh, um, uh, thin film, inorganic uh, semiconductor thin film, and you also see quantum rod and also organic solar cells in the bottom corner there. And the organic uh, photovoltaic and the, the, the record efficiency get close to about 20% and have been uh, around for, 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 I think, maybe 20 years, a bit uh, more. And it started with the three gentlemen, three gentlemen, three scientists. And so basically, in the uh, 1977, uh, they reported paper that uh, the, they can dope the polymer uh, polyacetylene uh, by halogen vapor, and they could increase the conductivity by many order of magnitude. And so since then, it really opened up this new field, and uh, they were awarded the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 2000. And so the, over the year, but polyacetylene, you cannot really process the, the thin film using different methods. Um, and so since then, synthetic chemists and material scientists have five different ways to make many different chemical structures so that you can process the material. And you can see here, I show on the right is the conductive polymer. People can use different building blocks. And then on the uh, 
you have the conducting polymer on your uh, on your on, on 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 the left and the small molecule on the right. I show the example here, but there are thousands of molecules out there until this day. And the reason people really interested in uh, sem organic semiconductors because you can do solution process. So I show you here some different methods that you can take the powder, you dissolve the, to, into organic solvent, you can form the beautiful color ink, and then from there you can put in uh, doctor blading, spin coating, wire bar, or, or inkjet printer, and you can print different size and shape and on the flexible substrate. And the started of the organic solar cell actually initiated with the discovery by Alan Heaver and his colleague, also Fred Rudo, and uh, they observed that if you take the polymer um, and then you blend in with the uh, fullerene or the buckyball, and then so they shine light to that and they see very ultra fast electron transfer from the polymer to the fullerene. And that was report in the first paper in 1993 and then a few, two years later in science. And, and then also it took a number of years until 2007 that Alan Heger again also showed that it's possible to make all solution process tandem organic uh, photovoltaic. People did that for silicon uh, long ago, and, but, but they, they demonstrate it's possible to do solution process. All the people have to evaporate uh, a mo small molecule. And so the organic semiconductor before, uh, early on in the community, uh, people focus on uh, developing organic light emitting dial. And since then you can use that for lighting, you can use for uh, a, a display, for example, OLED TV, and also uh, cell phone displays. And then since then, I, I know Zinan Bao were here in 2018. Uh, she also with Takao Someo, they, they really lead the effort of making flexible type of organic electronic for artificial skin to send temperature, to send uh, 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 pressure. And then, so but this leads us to the research in our group. Uh, so for my independent research at UCSB, uh, we focus on organic semiconductor and from small molecule to also conjugated polymer and then we use them for different type of application. Early on in my career I work on the OLED but for the past 19 years we also work a lot on organic solar cells and recently uh, on photo detector and also with the inspired by uh, Luisa here she really uh, 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 get me excited about this on bioelectronic uh, and, and so we start working on that for the past uh, couple of years. And uh, so the research approach that we use that in our group, we work closely with synthetic team that, uh, to design the materials. And then if a, a, they, they chain a single molecule or, or chain in the polymer, building block in a polymer or single atom in the small molecules, we would like to understand how that would change all the property and therefore the performance. And so we take the material, we learn to process it, we characterize using combination of tools, and then we evaluate the material performance. We also have the effort to understand the device physics. If a device works or doesn't work, we would like to understand why or, or, or how. And so a lot of time people uh, ask me the question, right? Uh, is organic solar cell going to replace silicon solar cell? And the answer is no. <laughs> and as you can see, but the advantage because there is no single solution to the future energy challenge and really depend on where you are and one, uh, uh, one type of solution is better, one technology better than the other or more suitable than the other. And so on the right there actually show silicon solar cell module and although the, it, it, it quite heavy and fragile, if you break it, it does not work anymore. And then also opaque. Okay? So we at the one on the, uh, the right and that show organic uh, solar cells and the module developed by Mitsubishi, uh, Mitsubishi Chemical Corporation in Japan. And the idea here, they want to do it kind of like the window screen. So you can put on existing window and then you can easily remove it or install it. And so if you can see it's semi-transparent, you can make it into different size and shape, uh, uh, it's lightweight, but the efficiency for the module is still uh, low. And, uh, and, and so beside the, that, you can see 
despite that it still have low efficiency, there are a number of uh, different applications of, uh, of organic solar cells. For example, the one on the top uh, 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 left over there, it shows basically organic solar cell uh, module using to cover the bus station in San Francisco at the time will produce it by Konaka. And then you see the recent project on the right by ASCA, and here they have this really beautiful OPV uh, module on this uh, uh, media uh, facade um, in Basel. And then you can use for variety type of application to, ch to charge your uh, 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 small electronic devices like cell phone and laptop. And then, so this is another uh, uh, application or demonstration that you can use for building integration. So this is the startup companies uh, based in Santa Barbara called Next Energy Technologies and from three of my former group members and they also license some of the pattern that developed by, by, by uh, our group. Um, and so the idea here that to make a solar cell window and so this uh, window here is the uh, it was shifted to Paris and uh, to be installed on that building in Paris. Um, and so basically we may not be aware but all this high rise building right, around the world. So the building consume about 40% of global energies and it you for, you know, temperature control unit, lighting, elevators, and, and many, many other things. And so that really, uh, the number, when I, I look it up, it's really shocking. 40% of the, 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 the global uh, energy generation. And that really uh, drive the climate change. And so therefore, if you can somehow, or every single glass uh, window or door of a building, so imagine you can coat them with the organic or semi-transparent solar cells and generate energy to you for the building. I think that will be really a uh, uh, help. Uh, so here, a variety of prototype projects by Helia Tech, which is a company based on small evaporated molecule uh, in Germany, and then uh, uh, for and also uh, by ASCA for the bottom one there. So you can really uh, 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 design the material that's semi-transparent, have different color, different size and shape. So therefore, from architecture point of view, you cannot tell them that you know that all we can offer the color or the size of window. You have to be able to change the size and shape according to their design. And. So besides putting on high rise and, and a scaper and glass building, you can also put on existing building. For example, the, the certain building structure that it cannot take the heavy weight of silicon solar cell, and now you can actually put on the uh, flexible uh, OPV module. And so we, we can also use it for the greenhouse to power the greenhouse. For example, you can control the band gap of the material and you can use, for greenhouse application, it's very important that the material absorb in the UV or the near infrared because you need to open up the, 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 the photon energy between 400 to, to 700 nanometer for the plant to absorb to do photosynthesis. Okay? So if you block that and basically the plant die. And, and so the nice thing with the organic solar cell, you can decode your greenhouse with the organic uh, solar cell, where using silicon, you, have, you need extra land to put the, uh, the silicon module, or you have to design a very elaborated greenhouse to put the silicon uh, solar module. And so with that, how, do, uh, uh, how does organic solar cell work? So basically, uh, unlike silicon material that have high dielectric constant of 11 uh, uh, over 11, and so organic dielectric constant is only around uh, uh, 2.5 or 3. So what does it mean? If you side light to that, the material absorb light, you create the exciton or the excited state, but the excitons strongly bow together. It's difficult to free up to form free carrier. So to do that, the, uh, the organic people back then, they have to take the donor material and you blend in with an acceptor so that you can separate the chart. You create the exciton and it do ultra fast electron transfer from the donor to the acceptor and then so that's how you can separate, uh, uh, you know, overcome the exciton binding energy to extract the chart carrier. And as you can see in this uh, cartoon demonstration that the chart generation and transport depends strongly on the film morphology. 
So to control the film processing method so that you can control the film morphology is extremely important in the organic solar cell community. And I could show you here when, what does it mean by morphology, right? And so morphology means the molecular arrangement of the molecule, the order of the donor and the acceptor, because you blend two components together, so you, they phase separated, and then you also go to the bulk device structure. So therefore, morphology requires understanding on many land scale. And so this plot show the current uh, progress of the OPV over the years. And I show, I show you here early on, people use fullerene, or fullerene derivative at the electron acceptor material. And then over the year, you can see when people switch from that to the uh, new type of molecular acceptor, you really boost up the uh, device uh, efficiency close to the 20% efficiency. So now I would like to highlight just a few key uh, uh, contribution from our group to the organic solar cell community. So first on the material development. And so early on in my career, I noticed that the challenge with the polymer, when you, when you buy the polymer, the same polymer, they have different performance. You change the batch, you have different performance keeping all, all the device parameters the same, the same concentration, the same solvent. And so at the physical chemist by training, I really like my result reproducible. So I don't like things that changing over time. So we try to see if we can, we look into making molecular donor material because it's a smaller unit. So you have to control every time you make the molecule, you have the same molecules. And so the, the, the the, 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 the pro of this, you approach it easy to synthesize and purify. You just run by the column, you purify a, a few times, and straightforward to functionalize, to make the molecule, and then you have good molecular packing, so you have better charge mobility. Uh, but we were not the first one who used the approach. Uh, and so we looked, there were a paper in 2000 uh, using the small molecule approach. But the efficiency is 10 to minus five. <laughs> It's extremely low, and that's why people were not interested using this approach. Okay? And so, but again, we did give it a try, and so we using this kind of uh, 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 conjugated uh, molecule. And in this case, we design why we systematically, uh, systematically changing the functional group, like for example, the side chain, the conjugated backbone, and also the end unit and we can vary the length of the molecule and we're using the donor, acceptor donor type of framework. And so when we first tried to submit the paper, it took two years. We got rejected by five journals <laughs> and, 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 and before we could publish the work. Uh, so the paper appeared uh, basically uh, uh, um, in 2008. And since then, we also changed the design of the molecule and then incorporate uh, different type of building block and continue to improve the device efficiency. And in, this, in the work here together uh, with Guy Bazan at the time at UCSB, uh, we can also show that for, for this particular system, we can get up to about 7% efficiency. At that point, people get very excited about that, right? And because at the time, the polythiophene uh, solar cell could get about 5% efficiency and then all the type of elaborated conjugated polymer donor, you can get around 7% efficiency or so. And so that get the few really excited about that. And then we turn into the molecular acceptor because at the time everybody using the uh, PCBM or fullerene derivative. And so again, we want to give it a shot. And so at the time we pair the molecular donor with another molecular acceptor and we there are a few other molecular acceptors uh, uh, already reported, but the efficiency also super low, and that's why the few were not interested. And so we saw here that it's possible to have good, uh, decent, good back then, because back then when the efficiency that, you know, only uh, seven, eight percent or so, that we can actually get three percent power conversion efficiency with the type of molecular acceptor. And that really uh, opened up their uh, a number of group and actually now uh, start making the uh, non-fluent non acceptor. 
So we go on and then we, uh, uh, together with the Bazan group, we design a number of the acceptor molecule where we can change the chemical structure, that we can control the band gap and the molecular morphology of the material. So we have a number, you can see here, you, we can tune the band gap of the material quite a bit. And by doing that, that allow us to make semi-transparent solar cell, for example, for greenhouse application. So this is the example of such semi-transparent OPV, the one on the right, where we take the, we put the camera and we take the photo down the hallway of our lab without the OPV. And the one on the right, we take through the OPV, semi-transparent OPV. And then you can see that it looks very, very similar. Okay. Um, and then we also, uh, uh, another contribution to the field that the discovery of solvent additive processing and also thermally blend. And so many people now they use it routinely but didn't know the story behind that. How, how did we discover this? And so for my postdoc, I came from Lou Bruce group and uh, he worked with the Go nanoparticle. And so back then, even until this day, the organic solar cell, the active layer is very thin, about 100 nanometer, 120 nanometer thick. So the idea we were thinking that if I can blend the gold nanoparticle into the active layer of the uh, uh, solar cells, and because the gold nanoparticle is 10, 15, 20 nanometer, when you side light to that, you have this uh, plasma, plasmonic that give rise right to the absorption of the gold nanoparticle. And, and the uh, electron cloud, the oscillation of electron cloud within the uh, gold nanoparticle give rise right to this uh, absorption, intense absorption band. So the idea here that we blend it in so that we can enhance the absorption of very thin layer. Uh, so but the gold nanoparticle to make solubilize in organic solvent, uh, so the synthetic chemists have to use ligand and the ligand, the octa octane tile. And so when we blend it in and then we make the solar cell and we on the right the control without the gold nanoparticle, no, normally to improve the device performance, people have to take the solar cell, they heat it up, they thermal and new that. But in, in, on the right, so we add in with only small amount of gold nanoparticle for at cast without thermal annealing, we can have better provide device performance. So then we about to submit the paper, but we decide to to, to ask the question, what exactly the gold nanoparticle density in our active layer that give rise to such uh, improved in the device performance. So here I take the device, I cut using focus ion beam, I cut the thin slide through it, I flip it over and I look with uh, transmission electron microscopy, the TEM. And you can see the, the black dot are gold nanoparticle. So to our surprise, there are not that many gold nanoparticle in our uh, active layer that give rise to almost double uh, 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 device performance. And so we talked for three hour meeting with the synthesis uh, person and asked him in detail how he make the gold nanoparticles. And then we found out that basically he used access ligand uh, uh, octane tile. And the next easy control experiment that could add in the ligand without a gold nanoparticle. And so that's what we did. And so you can see here that now we ended up having a really, really good performance with the ligand alone. And so that's how we discover the additive. And then we spent uh, together with Guy Bazan and, and collaborate, other collaborator to spend a lot of time to understand how the additive work. So basically the additive have high boiling point solvent. And so you add very small amount, 2% by volume, but at the, the film drying out, the solvent, the whole solvent evaporated. So basically 2% and, 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 and at molecular level is quite a lot. So enough to really slow down the drying process of the film that allow you to control the film morphology and therefore you have a better device performance. And so, and then we, uh, since then, uh, we also uh, uh, demonstrate on the small molecule blend uh, solar cell, also on the polymers. And so nowadays, if you look in the literature, most the record performance in OPV use solvent additive processing. Okay? And, and the solvent uh, additive processing also apply, people apply that in the perovskite solar cell community as well. And so beside that, we also very early on, uh, and, and in my career, so we also want to use ternary blend. 
And yet you can see here, back then, everybody, uh, so we want to enhance the absorption of our active layer. And as you can see here, we have the donor, uh, uh, we have our molecule, the donor at the acceptor, and the absorption end about, you know, 650 nanometer. So we have the idea if we add another component that have the absorption all the way close to 900 nanometer, you can enhance the absorption of the material. And so that basically that we did, that we reported early on in 2008, the use of the thermal blend and the right-hand side show the accidental quantum efficiency. Indeed, you do see the photocurrent contributed extend to uh, the, 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 the donor acceptor that we normally use polytyping and PCBM. So now uh, I would like to quickly uh, to highlight another one, which is the uh, uh, morphology. So I mentioned already to understand the morphology, you need to understand that on different land scale. And over the years, and together also with collaborators, we developed tools that allow us to probe morphology at different land scale. For example, using solid state NMR with uh, uh, Manchu Reddy, a young professor at University of Lille, that allow us to probe at molecular, atomic molecular level, the interaction between uh, donor acceptor molecules. And then using a grazing incident wide angle X-ray spectroscopy that allow us to look in at uh, uh, the different land scale. Now we look at the crystallinity, molecular orders, and also the molecular orientation of molecule with respect to the substrate. And together with Haro ID, we also apply uh, resonant soft X-ray uh, 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 technique to probe the degree of phase separation and the degree of mixing between the donor and acceptor. And then in, in, with us in the group, we also spend a lot of time to develop scanning, probe microscopy, and also TEM to look, probe that. So early on in my career, so this uh, uh, technique, uh, you couldn't buy the commercial instrument. So we bought an opto, uh, inverted optical microscope with the AFM and also light sort and everything we put it together. And then we also put that whole setup on the custom made design uh, glow box. And so that allow it to do nanoscale conducti uh, conductivity measurement uh, simultaneously with the film morphology. And then we can also do side light to that and you really measure the nanoscale solar cell property at the same time correlate feature with the morphology. And so we share the design to uh, two local company. And so now you actually can buy the setup, but many years later. So here show you the example of that type of data on the right. You have the porphyry on, on, on the left of porphyry on the right, the photocurrent. Right? You side light to that. How do we know we actually measure the photocurrent? Because if you turn off the light, the current go away. So and then we use that to try to characterize solar cell for sample such as the one here. So here when you change the donor acceptor ratio, and then we do see change in the surface morphology, but we do not know whether the feature you see here actually the donor or the acceptor uh, domain. And so by applying the tool that we can selectively map out the photocurrent generated by the donor or by the acceptor that allow it to assign the phase separation. For example, here on the, uh, on, on the far further away image, we see topography, and then you have the whole photocurrent in the middle, and then you also have the electron photocurrent on the right. And you can see basically the tall feature, you have high photocurrent, whole photocurrent, where uh, uh, you have almost zero electron current in subdomain. So that allow it to assign sub feature you see on topography, actually it, it uh, donor material. And so we can apply the tool and looking at the multi-layer inorganic solar cell. And uh, this is in collaboration with Stidemba because they have this stack of solar cell. It's very challenging to, to know if the device doesn't work well, which cause that uh, the device doesn't work well. So here, they actually have different doping level, indium doping, and then they see if you have higher indium content, you see the defect, the hole, and then we'll be able to go in and look in at those uh, defects, and you can see that in the defect, you don't see the photocurrent. 
And then we also apply the technique to help the unisolar cell uh, company to characterize silicon solar cell. And then we can see they have different uh, growth condition. And then that uh, we we'll be able to see that weak growth condition lead to better photocurrent and higher photocurrent and also correlate that to device performance. And you can see here there are a number of, of uh, 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 field that apply the tool to that. And so basically the remaining there are a number of challenges still remaining for the organic solar cell community. And I say you will hear later on uh, in some of the talk about the issue of the module and the lifetime and also the environmental. So I think because I'm running out of time and so I will jump into the uh, conclusion slide. And I just want to point out, so we see the highlight of the OPB, different uh, technology and so on. And, but to get to net zero emission, I want to leave you with this and, uh, and to think about that. And so we need a lot of chain in order. So one of that, for example, that government need to strengthen the policy and also they need to immediate and massive deployment of all available clean and efficient energy technology. Also need the people, the behavior chain, and also we need to uh, uh, increase and uh, electrify the, the, the world, right? And need to increase the, the use of low uh, carbon hydrogen and then also uh, carbon dioxide removal. We need the multiple approaches and not just one. And very important, I would like for us to think ahead of time. And we don't want to run into the same problem with plastic industry. So we just produce plastic and we worry about that later, about the recycling, right? And so imagine 30 years from now, all the solar cells we see around the world, people need to replace them. So what are we going to do with all the modules? They are big. Right? They're not like plastic bags. And so we need to, to think about that now and need to think about end of the product life cycle early on and also who will be responsible for this recycling solar module. So with that, I would like to acknowledge all of the work I've done and, and the honor that I stand here in front of you today. It's not really a, it's a great team of of, of students that behind all this work and also collaborator. I would like to thank them, my students and postdoc and also collaborator. The work in the solar cell is funded by Office of Naval uh, Research. And uh, before I go, I just want to, I'm not sure if every one of you here know about this uh, Vin Future Foundation. I helped to establish in Vietnam in 2020 and give pride to uh, uh, science technology breakthrough that impact everyday life of people. And some of the Exner uh, laureate, actually Zinan Bao, were our, one of our first female innovator and Omayagi. And so with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. 